So thanks for the opportunity to, to share some of, of uh, our research on the mental health of Ontario injured workers with, with permanent impairments. Um, and as John mentioned, my present affiliations with the Department of Psychology at Trenton. So um, I, I, I mean, I'm going to speak to things uh, perhaps more from a psychological perspective in terms of uh, mental health. Um, but I think there are going to be some messages for the, uh, the system and, and how we can um, uh, make the system run a little bit better for people and, and avoid the kind of outcomes that I'm going to talk about. So I thought I'd just set the stage um, a little bit. So I'm going to show a clip from a documentary uh, project that my wife, Kathy McInnes, is working on. And the project focuses on the life experience of disabled workers. Um, and Jamie is a disabled worker who kindly consented to be involved in this documentary. Um, so why don't I roll it here? Well, my entry was basically quite simple. Putting together a steel trellis and nothing out of the ordinary. Guy up on the ladder, putting a couple of bolts in, just <laughs> trying to align the holes in the top. Shifted, ladder popped off the edge of the beams, and uh, there he went. Um, he was toppling over, base the ladder holding it there. It's not something you're actually thinking of. It, it doesn't usually happen. You know, we, we're always prepared for this, but don't expect it to happen. And it does. And it did. The guy went over a little bit. I grabbed the ladder, caught it. He kind of jolted, caught his balance, and jumped off. At that time, I didn't realize I'd hurt myself at all. Next day, it was kind of a little worse. And by two days later, I, I seized right up and didn't move at all. Getting out of my bed in the morning, I went to put my feet on the ground and this, I had to reach for the back for the bed and I was like, I can't stand. That's where I realized I had a serious problem. Really confident probably to about the year mark. Ended up a year and a half going through this um, system. My medication went up. My um, going out with people in public really dropped off because I just became, you know what, I'm not going to be the same. I really started to come into a little ball of my own and just realize that this is how life's going to be. Became more reclusive. It just kind of affected everybody because the whole family became, you know, kind of homeward bound. Everybody stayed home. Like it was like, okay, they're not going to leave me alone. So they they stayed, which of course started causing turmoil over time. For me to make dinner was like a massive ordeal. You know, like my wife would work all day, come home, and she, I mean, she got to the point where she'd be frustrated. Like I couldn't even make dinner anymore. I'm bent over at four years old, I can't move, I can't play with my kids, I can't pick my daughter up. Two years, I never touched her. Mm -hmm. You know, I, they grab my hand and I'd be yelling at them, like, don't pull me, like, you're going to agitate me, like, I can't move. Yeah. So, I mean, after a year and a half, two years of that, like, you start, whoa, mm -hmm. am I living? And even with the medication, I mean, the doctor said it initially, it's, uh, you know, it has potential to be addictive. I was pretty naive to what addiction is, and uh, me thinking that I was well versed in the world, party, done everything in this world, and I thought I understood what addiction was. Mm -hmm. And to realize, all of a sudden, you know, two years, two and a half years down the road, because I used to take breaks from my medication to try and see how bad my pain really was. Right. And I would try and not take medication for a couple of days just to see. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I'd take it again, and everything went most young. Well, I got to a point where one time when I stopped taking the medication for a day and a half, and I was sick. And then at that point, I realized what addiction was. You know, at four hours, I, my body was saying, you know, I need that. And I want it, and it's, it's a terrible feeling. I got to a point where I didn't leave unless that bottle was close. Yes. I had them with me. Yeah. Like, what happens if I went out for the day and I'm not home by 2 o'clock mm -hmm. to get my pill? Mm -hmm. Well, can't have that. I'd have to have it with me and take one with me. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. so you were constantly, it governed everything I did. So that was that smack in the face, you know, my life changed within days. All of a sudden, my back's done. Mm -hmm. and like, that was, the, that was a hard thing to deal with, like, mm -hmm. especially sitting there. And when I realized that, you know, like, work was carrying on, everything was going on, and I wasn't there. 
I had a whole crew out there. I used to run a lot of guys, and they're gone. And, you know, they had moved on. I still had contact with a bunch of them, and I still do have contact with a bunch of guys I worked with. But, you know, over the time, it's dwindled down a lot. I mean, they were my life mm -hmm. at one point. You know, they were with me every day. You know, so it was a hard change. It was a really hard change to see that slowly disappearing. Injury was instant. Um, the realization of what it was, what had happened, took a long time. There was definitely times when I thought I'd be better off not living. I'm sure I'll go forward. Yeah. And, you know, that's one thing that I'm pretty confident about. Like, I can rebuild what I was, just mm -hmm. in a different form. So, Jamie's experience is probably not unusual to many people in the room. Um, and uh, we hear from Jamie how a seemingly small event at work, steadying a ladder for a co-worker, led to massive repercussions in Jamie's life. Loss of work. Uh, loss of sense of self, addiction, family tensions, or dimensions of work injury and disability that most people are unaware of. Injured workers themselves are aware of them, and so are many of the people that work with them. So I'm going to talk about the mental health problems among people like Jamie in Ontario. And I hope you leave to leave you with three um, messages that mental health problems are, a prevalent, are prevalent among injured workers suffering from long-term uh, consequences of work injury to the point that they're not quite um, as likely as not, but uh, getting there. And these problems, I would argue, are un unrecognized and attended to both formally and informally in the system. Um, and mental health problems are not just a, a function of pain and, and disability. Um, associated with permanent impairment. These are aspects of worker experience uh, in the system, uh, like st stigma that increases the burden of being an injured worker and makes the situation worse. So I think we need action uh, right from the get-go when people become injured to recognize and, and help minimize the kind of situation that uh, Jamie experienced. So for the agenda, um, I'd like to begin by discussing the nature of work injury, uh, nature of mental health problems and, and, and psychological impairment as they relate to um, um, work injury. And I'm going to talk about the results of a health survey of uh, injured workers with permanent impairments relating to the prevalence and timing of mental health problems. Um, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree that the survey findings paint a troubling picture of mental health among uh, people who have suffered work injury and, and long-term consequences as a result of work injury. Um, I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about uh, the results, whoops, uh, in terms of what I think is an under-identification of the problem. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time sharing uh, results from the survey that relate uh, stigma to mental health problems. Um, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of where we go from here with this uh, difficult problem. And then I'll turn it over to the panel to uh, discuss and talk about implications for the system. So is Jamie's experience unusual among injured workers? Um, well, in the year he was injured, Jamie was among the, the quarter million or so injured workers uh, or it, workers experiences, experiencing a workplace injury and, and among the 65,000 or so lost time claims and the 7% of lost time claims that, related, that, that were uh, among his construction worker colleagues and about uh, the, the one in five uh, claims that related to back injuries. Um, as it turned out, Jamie's injury was a little bit, perhaps a little bit more severe than, than um, uh, others. However, I'm not entirely convinced that his case would be all that different than others. Um, I worked as a clinician in occupational rehabilitation for years, and uh, stories like Jamie's were all too common. Um, and previous research would, would support this. So I mean, previous research in clinical and community samples indicates uh, 
very high rates of uh, mental health problems such as major depressive disorder among people coming into sort of a third level uh, uh, pain rehabilitation program, over half of them would be diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. Um, cohort studies where, where we look at workers going out from the time of injury have identified high levels of depression uh, within the first six months of injury and also subsequent to that. Um, so, probably not that unusual. And these, these rates of depression have been related to negative outcomes like uh, uh, low rates of return to work, um, as well as the suffering that goes on. Why is that the case? Well, at a physical level, pain and debility might obviously be associated with mental health problems. But at a psychological level, a loss of work results in a loss of worker role identity. Um, this creates a hole in our view of ourselves, a gap that can be filled by self-doubt and self-recrimination. Loss of work also means a loss of structure, a loss of social exchange, and a loss of financial opportunity. And this could be bad enough if, this, the, if, this, uh, if the system was simply neutral, but it isn't. Workers experience alienation and live in a state of uh, threat and fear and uncertainty. Um, benefits can be terminated if a worker is judged not to participate in a prescribed treatment, for example. Workers can also experience the system as adversarial. Um, and these problems can pile up into what Ellen McKechnie has referred to as a toxic dose that negatively, negatively reflect, reflects, uh, uh, affects recovery um, and a worker's ability to uh, return to work. And pervading worker experience is the feeling of being stigmatized or othered, uh, owing to the constant discourse of abuse that goes on by, by everyone within the system. And in my experience, you know, when you sit down and talk to an injured worker who's coming into a rehabilitation program, sometimes the first thing out of their mouth would be, well, you know, Fergal, I, I, we know that, I know that there are people who are abusing the system, but I'm not one of them. And that worker has just participated in that discourse. Now, if we think about mental health, though, what's the common thread among these experiences? Well, from a psychological standpoint, it's stress. And stress is a common foundation for the development of mental health problems. So stress has a way of getting under our skin and into our being. And if we uh, look at the pathway between a potential stressor and a, a mental health outcome, um, stress uh, evokes brain responses, autonomic nervous system responses, and hormone responses. Um, and this is well documented. Well documented. And, and as a consequence, we react physiologically, we, we react behaviorally and, and emotionally and, and through our thoughts. Um, for example, uh, the, the uh, experience of threat activates this old part of the brain called the limbic system. And uh, the limbic system sort of integrates and governs um, experience of, of, of threat and uh, directs the body to respond in that way. And it's a good thing in that we can adapt to our environment, but when we're placed under stress burden for long, long periods of time, it becomes maladaptive. It becomes overreactive. And so our body just gets queued up and, and, and amped up to experience stress. And likewise with our thought patterns. Our thought patterns change. Um, we develop more negative views of, of ourselves and the world. And in terms of our behaviors, we tend to take less better care of ourselves, let's, let's say, um, which all precipitate the kinds of things that uh, we see or I'll, I'll show you among um, these injured workers. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is based on a study that was designed by, by uh, my colleague Perry Ballantyne on the uh, health and healthcare trajectories of injured workers with permanent impairments. So I won't talk a whole bunch uh, about the detail of the study, but this was a cross-sectional telephone survey of injured workers 
um, who experienced uh, uh, permanent impairments between 2002 and 2007. And uh, they were asked about a, a, a whole bunch of different things. Um, but one of them was uh, long-term conditions, uh, mental health-related uh, conditions, so depression, alcoholism, uh, drug dependence, memory impairment, um, as well as, as other kinds of, of uh, long-term health conditions that weren't necessarily diagnosed. So, uh, for example, there are reports of, of you know, abusing medications or um, uh, substances as well as symptoms of anxiety and depression. And we also, they were also asked about the timing of onset of these problems. So did it occur before or after the uh, workplace injury? Uh, we administered a depressive symptom scale called the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression uh, Scale, which is a widely used and well-validated uh, measure of, of depressive symptoms. Um, we asked them about their demographics, their employment, their physical health, uh, their stigma experience, stress experience, social support. Um, yeah, I don't think there were, there were too many things that they weren't asked about. When I began working with Perry on the survey as, as part of my postdoc, one of the things that stuck out, out to me just developing the initial, co the initial code book was, were the high rates of reported um, uh, diagnosed depression among the group. And, and having some background in it, I thought, wow, that is... That is uh, interesting and troubling. And so that led me to focus, in, hone in on the, the uh, mental health uh, side of things in the survey. And so um, one of the questions that, that I uh, set out to address is, is how prevalent mental health problems were among these uh, individuals. And when did these problems emerge? And you can read about this, if you like, in a paper uh, published in the Canadian Journal of Public Health in, in 20, uh, 2012. Um, and so in the study, I looked at a range of diagnostic and, and uh, symptom and behavioral and functional indicators among the workers that will be associated with mental health problems. So one of the things we looked at was prevalence. And what this uh, uh, chart shows you is you know, we looked at a, a number of different outcomes, diagnosed depression, diagnosed dependence, uh, uh, reported substance abuse, reported medication abuse, various symptoms, sleep problems, and memory impairment. And what sticks out is uh, the high prevalence of reporting of diagnosed uh, depression, for example, um, as well as some of these psychological symptoms, depression, anxiety, um, problems with concentration. And when you look at the reported prevalence among this group, it's much higher than you would see in um, a the Canadian Community Health, Health Survey uh, finds a lifetime incidence of about 11.3%. Okay? Now in this group, you're talking about um, a shorter time span. So you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily an apple, apples to apples comparison, but in other groups of people experiencing pain, you still see a lower uh, proportion of people reporting a diagnosis of depression. Um, and the other uh, things that we looked at were sort of, you know, variably um, down or up uh, in proportion to, to what's been found in the uh, in the research previously. Now, looking at that 38.1%, you might say, well, wow, that's really high, but a lot of that might have occurred prior to the injury. And when we look at the timing of onset, though, about 81% of those uh, uh, reported uh, cases that reported a diagnosis of, of depression reported it after the, uh, after the injury. Um, so that's one thing I'd point out here, but I'd, I'd also point out in, in the data, because you might just say, well, these people just have an ax to grind, and so they're just all reporting bad stuff happening, and there's certain, certainly recall bias that could happen. But not everybody. Uh, reported that things started after the injury. Okay? In fact, a proportion about equivalent to what you might expect in a population reported that it happened before the injury. 
So what this shows you, so we asked them about diagnosed depression, and, and, but we also asked them about depressive symptoms in the two week period prior to the, uh, to the interview on the, the CESD. And what this chart shows you is the, um, uh, the overall results of the, the CESD uh, depressive symptoms scale. So on the, the, the axis over there, you've got the mean uh, CESD score, okay? And the range of the scale is from zero to 60, where zero represents no depressive symptoms over the past two weeks, and 60 represents very high depressive symptoms over the past two weeks. So the, the bar on the left is the overall um, mean and the accuracy of that estimate. Um, that line represents a, a, a suggested cutoff point for the diagnosis of, of clinical depression. So uh, scores of 60 and above on that scale are, 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 are sort of associated with, well, they're associated with, with uh, people who might uh, be experiencing a diagnosable depression problem. And um, uh, the, the second bar there, that's people who reported no diagnosis of depression. So they were sitting right on the mean in terms of depressive symptoms. Um, the people who reported a pre-injury diagnosis, their average was, average was 24 on the scale, and those with a post-injury diagnosis was, was 31 on the scale. Um, so there's, there were, were high rates of depression that had a post-injury onset, and the people, when they were asked about their immediate experience, reported high depressive symptoms. So the, the, the question then is, you know, I ask myself, so are these things formally recognized? Um, in other words, do people who have high depressive symptoms also have a diagnosis of depression? Because that means a whole bunch of things, right? That means that they might be able to access mental health services, um, either paid for by the board or not. Um, I looked at the, the diagnosis of depression and, and, and I broke people up into whether or not they had a high depressive symptom score. So the dark bar is folks with uh, depressive symptom scores of less than or equal to, to 15 and the green bars are people who have a depressive symptom score the, greater than 15. So these people you might expect to have a diagnosis of depression. And in fact, those people who had no diagnosis, um, uh, when, when we looked at people who had low depressive symptoms, that's the pattern that, that emerged. Okay? By and large, those folks didn't have a diagnosis of depression. But when we looked at the people who did have high depressive symptoms, uh, it was virtually a 50-50 split. Okay? And of course, you'd expect to see the exact opposite pattern here, where uh, the green bar on the left should be really low in terms of no diagnosis, and the green bar on the right should be a lot higher. And this isn't, this isn't a unique finding. In uh, René Louise Franche and uh, uh, Carnite's study, they also identified this problem of identification of people. Um, in their sample with uh, uh, high depressive symptoms but no diagnosis of depression. So do people access mental health um, services uh, or did they among this sample? Um, well, among the, the, uh, the sample survey, the vast majority didn't uh, access mental health services. So for example, if you look at the bar on the left, those are people who were asked whether or not they act, accessed the service of a psychologist in the last 12 months. And 435 out of the, the 494 total um, had not, uh, 52 had, and seven didn't know whether they had or not, probably relating to you know, maybe the type of professional that they saw, they may have saw, seen a counselor or a social worker or something like that. Um, and it was a similar pattern with psychiatrists. The bar on the right there is, is where we asked people whether they needed uh, service but did not receive service. And 47 of the sample indicated that that was in fact the case. Um, there was a follow-up question as to whether or not people had received care uh, as a result of contact with a mental health professional. Because sometimes people are sent you know, by the board or family physician or whatever to uh, mental health professionals for uh, some type of assessment, independent assessment, let's say. Uh, 
um, which may not and may never result in any form of care. And um, about two-thirds reported that they had received care as a, as a consequence of their contact with a mental health professional, um, and about a third not. So that's, um, that's sort of the prevalence, um, onset, uh, identification and and whether or not people reached out for help or were directed towards help and in fact uh, received help but I was also interested in um, people's experience in the system and the extent to which it might be associated with mental health problems and stigma is something that is is pervasive and talked about you know uh, talked about all the time in terms of the experience of injured workers as well as the research uh, so what, what uh, and we asked about stigma, and we asked about stigma sources um, as well. So two-thirds of the sample reported that they had experienced stigma at some point from the time of their work injury on. Then we asked them about the source of stigma, and there, two, there were 12 sources. Um, ranging from family, friends, acquaintance, acquaintances to people they might come in contact with in the workers' compensation system to uh, healthcare providers, co-workers, supervisors, and the like. And the highest rate sort of, of, of stigma experience uh, were, were reported to be associated with interactions with co-workers, supervisors, and compensation agents, um, upwards of 60% of or two-thirds. Um, Acquaintances and other work personnel were reported at about 50%. Um, family and physicians were actually about the same, around a third. Sort of, so what? Well, those people reporting experience of stigma. So this, this chart is, again, it's the CESD total, or CSD scale on the, on the y-axis there on the left-hand side. And um, the, the, the box plot on the left is the group of people who reported stigma, and the box plot on the right is the people who didn't report stigma. And what, what I'd point out is, uh, and that's the, the clinical cutoff for depression there again. Um, so what I'd point out is that the, the you know, sort of center of that uh, distribution on the left with the people who reported stigma is much higher and significantly higher than, than that on the right in terms of their depressive symptoms. And the, 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 they also reported, well, we, I totaled up the number of sources of stigma that they experienced. And, and depressive symptoms were um, positively related to the number of sources of stigma that they reported. So as the number of, of and they could have a maximum of 12 or a minimum, you know, minimum of zero, if they hadn't reported stigma at all, um, depressive symptoms went up as a function of that. So what about social support? And I guess social, you can frame social support in two ways. You can frame it as, as social support or unsocial support, right? How does it uh, affect things? Well, among the sample, as people's reports of social support go up, their reports of depressive symptoms go down. Um, but does that differ between people who experience stigma or not? And um, it does. Uh, at low levels of social support, but not so much at high levels of social support. So the, the upper line there are people who report stigma, and that's the pattern of observations, the correlation between uh, social support and depressive symptoms among that group. The bottom line are people who don't report stigma, or report no stigma experience, and that's the correlation uh, across levels of social support um, in that group. And so what you see is that at low levels of social support, you get, this big you get a big division in depressive symptoms. Um, whereas at high levels, not so much. So social support seems to help to buffer a bit the um, uh, effect of stigma. We could put it that way. And, and conversely, low levels of social support is, is, is a bad thing, particularly among those who uh, experience stigma. Um, so, I think I'm getting the hook, Ian, yeah. Uh, so I'm getting the hook here. Uh, I, I had a case pulled out of the survey just to show you what 
the experience of an individual worker might be like um, within that. But I think I'll um, move on then just to some of the messages and a few ideas in terms of, of where we go from here. Um, well, I, th I think recognition or lack of recognition is, is a big problem in uh, the system. And this is among stakeholders. And I'm talking, about, I'm talking about people who make decisions here. And I'm also talking about people who work with injured workers. Um, and one of, the, one of the important things I think needs to happen is that stakeholders need to be made aware uh, that the person that they're talking to um, could be, you know, could be in distress and difficulty uh, as a consequence of their work injury. Um, my mom used to say, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. And I think that applies, um, that applies big time here. Uh, when, when injured workers come in, into uh, contact with um, adjudicators, or healthcare professionals, or what have you. I think those people need to recognize um, the burden of, of work injury apart from and outside of the, the physical uh, uh, burden and debility that are associated with it. Um, so we need, I think we need support. So that's sort of a primary prevention <laughs> strategy is, uh, you know, it sounds stupid and simple, but it's like, it's like be nice to people. You know, and make, make, make the assumption that this person is coming to you in distress and, and in need of help. Um, secondly, as people experience work injury and fall into uh, problems with mental health, they need support. And that support needs to be provided in the system. Uh, with, related, with, with regards to stigma, I think stigma, stigma is continually framed as a moral problem. And I think that, that, that that that's a problem in itself. Like stigma is not just a moral problem. Stigma is a drag on recovery. Okay, and stigma is a is a blunt social instrument that's used to get people into line. Um, and I would argue that it's not used very effectively here in such in 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 this system. Um, and then I, I was going to talk about this with John, the case. But experiences like deeming and experience rating and this sort of thing, they, they not only directly burden the worker, but they cause behavior on the part of others that add to the stress burden of workers and consequently, I, I would argue, mental health problems. Um, so I, I think I'll wrap it up there. I'd like to acknowledge the Rackway Health Survey Team, uh, my postdoc supervisor, Perry Ballantyne, uh, who's the lead on this. Uh, Pat Vino, who's the community health lead, uh, Becky Casey, who couldn't be with us today. She's on a postdoc at uh, York. Uh, some of our students that have helped, uh, Kirsten Schultz, Vicki, um, and the other students that are coming on board to help us. So um, thank you. <laughs>